sounds like can you guys hear him? Okay, great. Um, so my name is Deborah Underwood, and I'm a picture book author. I have been writing picture books since 2001. My first picture book was published in 2010. We can discuss that. And I have, I think, I've published 11 picture books at this point, one easy reader, some chapter books, and I have eight picture books coming out in the next several years. senior publicist for children's books at Chronicle Books in San Francisco. I've been at Chronicle for six years, worked in different areas of publishing before that. We publish 90 what we call SKUs, SKU, stock keeping units of children's product per year, and about, I'd say 25-30% of that is picture books. The other types of publishing we do are um, uh, board books, middle grade novels, YA novels, and what we call formats, which are things like uh, flashcards or puzzles or stationery or other sorts of things uh, for children, usually made out of paper, um, that we um, publish at Chronicle. Thank you. And Laura Wong. Hello. Oh. <laughs> okay, I'm Laura Wong. I illustrate children's uh, picture books, um, mostly for dial books for young readers, but I also do a lot of book covers for other publishers, like uh, Random House, Scholastic, HarperCollins. And um, I also teach full-time at Cal State Northridge, um, teaching illustration. I have some of my students here. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's it. Great, thank you. So the first question goes to Deborah. Deborah, how does the author and illustrator work together to create a picture book? Ooh, is this a trick question? Because yeah. they don't. They don't. I, my students know this, but what the process is, is the writer writes the manuscript, and then either through an agent or directly to a publisher sells the manuscript, and then the publisher is the one that finds the illustrator for the manuscript. Depending on sort of where you are or who you're working with, you may have some input into who the illustrator is, or you may have no input at all. So the answer is no. <laughs> And I, I'll agree that's true 99% of the time, but there are some author and illustrator teams, people who are pals, people who have worked together before, either because they know each other and, and have collaborated, or because the author has worked with them together before. Specifically, I'm thinking at Chronicle, um, Amy Krauss Rosenthal and Tom Lichtenfeld are um, author illustrator team we have published successfully many times at has several other houses, and they live close to each each other in Chicago, they're great friends, they collaborate a lot. So it is, um, the scenario Deborah described is, is mostly true, but there are definitely are folks who, especially when they reach a certain level um, in their career, who work together. Um, and it's great when they do, because I love having those dream teams on our list. Thank you very much. Deborah, another question for you. This is a two-part question. What are the benefits of an author using an agent, and what criteria should an author look for in an agent? The benefits of using an agent are many. Um, as we've talked about in my class, not only can the agent really get to know all the editorial needs at the various publishing houses and have a much better chance of placing a manuscript with them, they also negotiate the contract. And there are also just all sorts of things that can come up during the publication process that might be problematic or the author might have concerns about. And it's really great to have an agent as an advocate to go in and, and fight those battles for you. The, the ideal thing, the thing that I like about working with an agent is I don't have to discuss any of this stuff with the editor. I don't want any kind of antagonistic relationship with my editor. If, you know, if I want more money, I don't want to go and say, I want more money to the editor. I want my agent to go and say, my author deserves more money. I, I want to keep that relationship as clean as possible. Um, the, the, the drawback, obviously, is that the agent takes 15%, but for most of my author friends, we find that money very, very well spent. As, as I was telling my students in class, if my agent has sold a whole bunch of books to a particular publishing house, they kind of know how much of an advance they're going to be getting from that particular publishing house, and it does vary quite a bit. So, you know, she'll be able to say, this is for this house, this is a good thing, I think we should stick with this, or hey, we got this from this up for this other author, and so I'm gonna fight for more money for you. Um, and the way really to tell about how or what kind of agent would be best for you, I strongly suggest that you go to conferences and hear agents speak. 
because that will help you just get a sense of their styles, whether they're focused on, it's on building you for a whole career, whether they're okay with people writing across genres. One of the things that I really appreciate about my agent is she, she wants us to all be reaching and growing, whereas some agents, I think, say, I want to market your picture books because that's what I can sell and I'm not going to encourage you to do other stuff. So, um, and just talk to people. We've talked a lot about the importance of SCBWI, the Society for Children's Book Writers and Illustrators, and um, networking with other writers is really your best tool for finding an agent that's going to work for you. I think it's um, usually for illustrators who have sold a lot of books because the agents want to make you know, some money off their work. And um, so illustrators that are selling you know, large quantities of books and will have an agent. Uh, I don't personally use an agent. Um, my books, I think most I've sold books, maybe about 100,000 or so. But I have a relationship with my publisher that I keep I maintain that relationship, <clears throat> so I don't have an agent looking for other work. Um, I get other work in other ways. People see my work or they go to my website and that. Um, so I think it's mixed. I guess to answer your question, I, I don't maybe Laura can answer this question too, like how many illustrators use agents versus who don't, but I think many of them do not. Um, on our list, gosh, I, I'd hate to put it first, a good number of them do. Um, a lot of them um, have agents who represent their illustrators, not just for book publishing, but for other projects as well. So they're illustration agents who represent their artists for editorial work or stationery or pillows or you know any, any place illustration exists. So there are definitely illustrators who specialize in those, um, in, in just representing illustrators across um, a lot of different categories. Um, but I'd say a good number of our illustrators are represented by agents. The, um, but most of the work, um, a lot of the work is work for hire rather than um, royalty. So it's a different negotiation and a different and a different process. But it's um, and certainly once an illustrator starts to become in demand uh, for similar reasons that um, Deborah mentioned, having an agent really will serve you well. And it just it frees you to, to do the work you need to do, which is illustrating. Yeah, I would agree with that. Illustrators who work in a lot of other areas of editorial, advertising, and books, they usually have agents. That's true. So the other part of that was, how does an artist get an agent? What's the best way for an artist, a young, talented artist who wants to find an agent? Uh, how do you suggest that? Well, I think getting an agent is almost like getting a client, really. You, you go about the same way. Um, you have to show your work, you have to have a website, you have to um, approach them, you know, they have to think that they can um, make money by selling your work. So you have to promote yourself the way you would to any other client. Thank you. Uh, Laura, So um, um, I know YA gets a lot of attention in the media in terms of what's what's really selling, but um, picture books are doing really well for us. And what's exciting, and, and especially there's a lot of chatter about digital and Kindles and online, picture books do not transfer well to digital media. So it's really sort of the last category in the bookstore that's going to stay in the bookstore. So I'm pretty bullish on, on picture books. Um, and um, and so I do see them continuing to um, to do well, and it's and it's not something we are pulling back on as a house at Chronicle, which I'm excited about. Um, the I mean that's not to say that there are not e versions of picture books. There are, and you can buy them, and people do, and people have, you know we talk about the back end, you know, handing it back to your kid in the car <laughs> so that to keep them occupied, and that happens. But um, but it's not the same experience and. 
parents always want to sit on the couch with their kids. Teachers always need books to um, to read, and it's the la you know novels um, are a different story, and people who are writing novels have a different um, market that they're entering into with ebooks, which are cheaper and easier. I mean, they can be easier to read um, on a Kindle, but that's not true of picture books. So I'm I'm feeling I'm strong on them, and there's the next level um, discussions that sort of happen around picture books are things like word count, you know, are, are, do people have the patience for longer picture books? Um, and um, picture books that address uh, different areas of um, experience around kids and what the market for those are. There's a lot of talk about diversity in all areas of publishing, specifically children's publishing, and a lot in picture books, making sure that every community can see itself in the books and that people who are well represented in books can see other people in the books as well. Um, and how we address that need and also make money is, is, is one of the challenges that we're facing. And so finding those kinds of books that can do the work that, that books need to do but also make money for the publisher are that's the that's the sweet spot, and that's where we want to be. Calligraphy. Uh, you, you addressed this in our class just a few moments ago, but I think it takes uh, hand turn again to the individuals who are new here. What are audiobooks, and what do they encompass? Are they limited to books on paper? So, as we talked about in the previous presentation, people don't use cassette tapes anymore, right? <laughs> is still pretty prevalent and digital downloads are, are pretty much what people are doing right now as far as accessing audio content from the internet um, and just on a, on a regular basis what people are able to do is um, download it onto their onto their any kind of tablets any kind of handheld device an audio book is a book translates that into an audio with it and into a narrated piece. And that can range from um, something that has a single narrator that is doing just some that is just somebody reading what's on there. Um, or it can be split up into a, a few different narrators as well as other character voices um, that are incorporated and that could be several different actors that are used that are using sort of audio extras in audiobooks recently. Like there's bonus content in an audiobook that's not that's not just straight reading, which it makes so much sense. Like that's that's super smart. Thanks. Thank you. Laura, can you please explain common core curriculum to our audience and encourage our students to focus more on nonfiction picture books, or is there still a healthy market for fiction? Um no, I can't. Um, it's that's <laughs> honestly that's that's um, a little above my pay grade as uh, as a as a publisher, and it's something that is. Uh, do y'all know what Common Core is? I can tell a little a little bit about it. So it is a revision of the standards by which um, uh, students are um, measured um, in order to demonstrate proficiency in certain skills at certain grade levels, and there has been a big. And so the Common Core State Standards are big and challenging and controversial, and you ask 10 people about them, you will get 10 answers about whether they're good or bad or actually change anything in the classroom when the rubber meets the road and what it means for students and what it means for teachers. And um, I, and, um, so it's not something I'm, I'm expert on, but I know it's something that gets talked about a lot. Um, it has not impacted uh, Chronicles Publishing um, in terms of the books that we acquire for our list. We've always done a mix of fiction and nonfiction. We've always done, um, uh, always included the appropriate end matter and um, other kinds of things that make a book um, appropriate for that market. Um, and 
what it has done is for a lot of our books, and you'll hear more about this when we um, uh, uh, break for my session this afternoon, is we do accompanying teacher's guides for a lot of our books that helps teachers um, use the books in their classroom, um, helps librarians recommend books for teachers to use in their classrooms. And those teacher's guides are now aligned to the Common Core. Um, so we do hire folks who, who could answer that question better than I could um, to align the books um, to Common Core standards. And that's um, super helpful and is really um, more of a marketing tool for us than um, a driver in how we acquire things. So I would never, ever, ever recommend that anybody create something with the idea of having it, quote, meet the Common Core. Um, because pretty much any book, um, I mean, there's a Common Core Teacher's Guide for Battle Bunny. I mean, that is not, <laughs> there is nothing nonfiction or capital E education, educational about um, Battle Bunny, as great as a book it is. But there's a Common Core Online Teacher's Guide because um, it does all those big fancy pedagogical things that books can do as long as you have the um, ability to make those connections, which any smart teacher can, and it can do it easily with the help of the teacher's guide that the publisher creates. Can I ask that? Yeah, well, if I, if I steered my students wrong, I want to apologize, but one of the reasons that I was encouraging, you know, if you're interested in some nonfiction thing to think about it was, I actually had a school visit be canceled on me because that, that they were so, like everybody's in this kind of common core swirl right now because nobody quite understands it. And, nobody, and they, this, this place had hired me to come in and do talks to their students, and they found out they could not purchase my nonfiction books easily because they're really more for school and library markets, and they couldn't get them, and, and they found out they, they couldn't have the books available for students to buy, so they said, no, you know, Common Core, we have to cancel you, for cancel your nonfiction books. So this is just kind of some of the swirling confusion about all this stuff, and clearly Laura's absolutely right. They could have, you know, there are plenty of English standards. They could have aligned a lot of things in my books, too, but... But um, but I was just I, I you know I, I did not know my assumption was just that the publishing industry might or some publishers might be looking to increase their nonfiction offerings just because there is this kind of swirl of panic they might be able to capitalize on. Yeah, and and there very well may be I can you know just speak and I did I had a friend who's a who's a parent whose daughter came home and said my teacher said I can't read novels because of Common Core and and which is like. There's so much to unpack about that. Like, who knows what the teacher really said to the daughter? Who knows how much the, you know, it's just, but it, that just speaks to how much swirl and confusion there is about Common Core. And and sometimes that's how it it um, it impacts actual kids and, you know, what, and what they're reading and what they're hearing and what, and, and, you know, teachers are so overworked and doing so much and there's only so much I think some of them can really you know, and, and how much access they have to professional development and the kind of workshops and things like that that really help them um, um, implement the standards. So I think every teacher, every classroom um, has a different a, a different way that they're doing it. But. Thank you. I appreciate everyone's perspective too because you're all looking at it from a different view and, and it's all equally valid. So thank you. I appreciate that. Allegra, how does the industry determine which books are selected to become audio books? And you know, if, again, if these are questions too, if someone else wants Um, how does the industry select them? Yeah, how does the industry determine which books are selected to become audio books? I don't know necessarily if the industry selects it. I think basically the industry is a, a product of what, what gets selected by um, authors and initiatives to turn their content into audio books or publishers initiatives to turn their publications in, in, into an audio form. Um, and so what I think ends up happening is that um, the ones that get the audio, that get turned into audiobooks first are primarily the ones that have the resources um, and you know to to make that happen. So um, and the time, you know, if you have an author that um, is working full time in the day gig and then you know has many other projects going on, trying to pin them down to record. Maybe would be hard and might take a long time to kind of make that project happen. Um, but if you have the resources of, say, having the budget for a studio uh, that where you can pin them down for, you know, about four or five hours for a couple of sessions and just crank it out, then, yeah, you can afford to do that. It's going to happen a lot quicker. Um, Chronicle Book 
audiobook side, we um, don't publish audiobooks, but we often have the rights to um, uh, sell audiobooks and sub rights. So I'll talk more about this in this, this afternoon as well. But so if we acquire a novel, we acquire various rights, not only to publish the physical book, but sometimes we acquire sub rights, which means we sell the audiobook rights to an audiobook publisher. So generally, we don't do a lot of that just because of the kind of visual publishing we do, but um, several of our um, novels, both middle grade and YA, have been sold to an audiobook publisher, and, um, and those do really well. The other thing that's interesting to me about audiobooks is, especially because I have a 15 year old son, and he's not a reader as much as I've tried, and it, it actually makes me happy at the more authors and librarians and publishers I talk to, there are just some kids who aren't. But, he loves audiobooks and always has. And I've had many reading experts tell me, that counts, audiobooks count. And I think what's revolution, and so it's exciting for me as a parent and a publisher is that it's a, such a way in, especially for boys and teenage boys, because it's like, you know, they're listening on their phones. It's like here, it's not like reading a book. And some of the cultural things about reading that are still have to be overcome. Um, so it's, um, so it's exciting to me that so much is available to, to kids to read, and it's available in a way that is so easy and accessible to them. He can go to the library, download an audiobook, and read and listen on his on his phone, and he, he does that all the time. So there's a lot. It's it's exciting that that's such a way in for kids for for reading. Actually, a couple of my picture books have been turned into audio books, but. Neither of them, I, 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 that was not my decision at all. It was, as Laura said, the publisher had the sub rights and they decided to, actually I think A Balloon for Isabel got licensed or whatever to Scholastic and I think Scholastic was the one that did that. So I mean, you know, the disc just sort of showed up with no input for me. With the, um, with the cat books though, Dial said, you know, I think we're gonna do an audio, I mean an enhanced edition so you can download it on Amazon and, and have the pages but have the reader too and so I actually did the recording for that one. But you know, it was great. I walked into the studio, I did it. I didn't have to do anything. I was working with a director and an engineer and a, you know, somebody from the publisher. I didn't have to do anything other than go in there and try to figure out how to narrate audio books. <laughs> it's just not necessarily easy. Yeah, well, it kind of goes the reverse way for the illustrator in the sense that um, the editor will, will often tell me, or in the text, if I'm revising or retelling something, that you don't have to say it if you're going to show it. So if it's a picture book, you're telling a lot of the stories of the pictures. So you don't have to be redundant in the text. And I, you know, I think Deborah could speak to that as well, but um, especially for a picture book. You, you don't really need to do that. You don't want to do that because they, that's what the pictures are for. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, Deborah, if you want to touch base on it, because some people just want to part of the class and you make great comments on that. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it essentially, I was, I was telling people that one of the hardest lessons for me and one of the things that took the longest for me to learn is what you want to do is leave room for the illustrator to make the story their own when it lands in their lap. And you don't want to take choices away from them by using words you don't need to do. It's essentially just stripping things down so when it gets to them, I, I gave my class the example that Renata Liebska, the quiet book illustrator, said to me, she said, if a writer writes too much, it's like I'm tracing a line that's already been drawn. And I thought that was such a wonderful image because you want the illustrator to have as much creative freedom as possible and you want to give them those choices. And as writers, that's tricky for us because we like words. Yeah. <laughs> This is a general question for the panelists. How much, uh, how much should a first-time author or illustrator expect to be paid for a picture book? That's a couple. <laughs> uh, how can they avoid exploitation? And 
And um, Oleko, the same question would go to you with respect to how you work in terms of what they should be able to do. Um, it, it, you know, it's not a cop-out answer, it's the truth. It really, really depends and really, really varies. And there are authors, a first-time author, illustrator, at a mid-sized house like Chronicle, probably in the five to $10,000 range for their first book. Um, maybe more if you get an agent, maybe less if you don't. Um, and um, But it can really vary. There are debut authors whose books go to auction and they get a lot of money. And um, they're, um, so it, it really varies. Um, you know, you're certainly, I mean, Deborah's probably mentioned this already, but you know, you know, it's, no one's, not a lot of folks are getting rich, not a lot of folks are making their living solely on writing children's books. It's, it, for most people, it's part of a larger puzzle of their career, and, um, and it, you know, it's, nobody in this entire, very few people in this business are, are getting rich. Um, in terms of avoiding exploitation, um, Working with a reputable agent, working with a reputable publishing house, um, just being professional in everything you do is um, is you know nobody is nobody enters this business to exploit their authors and illustrators. Um, you know that everybody is served by serving the author well, serving the agent well, serving the book well, and building a relationship because you want to continue to publish with people who are producing good work. Um, so I don't I can't think of too many instances where that has happened. There was a publisher in Canada called Simply Read Books that's been in the publishing industry news recently for not treating their authors well or giving royalty statements on time or those kinds of things. But that it's not often you hear things like that. And I think that my understanding is that is a case of a very small publishing house with a very overwhelmed and overworked publisher who just sort of got snowed under things and did not necessarily have the intent to um, exploit his authors and illustrators. Um, so, but, but you know, there's all kinds of weird outfits out there who are more than happy to take your money and sell you a dream, and I would be very wary of those. We've generated probably hundreds of ideas between us, right? It's not about the idea, it's about the execution. And the execution is what the people in my class now know is something that just takes a lot of time and a lot of work and a lot of energy. The only weird kind of thing that I got that got on my radar was the very first critique group I went to, it was a kind of an ad hoc thing at a conference that I went to, and they said, oh, anyone wants to break into critiques, do that. And there were four of us, and this woman read this thing, and it was it was almost word for word Wombat Divine by Mem Fox, except <laughs> except it was like a kangaroo or some other Australian thing. And and, and it was funny because a woman that I, I didn't know any of these people, but the woman across, we were just kind of like, and I, we, we both clearly knew that this was just a completely plagiarized weird story. And, and, and it was funny because she said, well, you know, I, that's awfully similar to this other published book. And, and afterwards, she and I actually became very good friends because we're like, should we tell somebody that this? Or do you think she's doing it on purpose? Do you think she, you know, so, so that was the, I, in, the, in my whole, all my years, that was the only issue about something like that. Something that is a little bit more of concern to me is just like in critique groups, I just ran into this, you know, one of my friends had an ending for her story and then I wrote a draft of something a month later and I just didn't even connect that it was kind of, influ it wasn't exactly what she did, but as soon as I read her story again, I was like, oh my gosh, that's so similar to her ending and so, you know, we sort of talked about it and then we're like, well, should we change both of them or which, you know, which one of us, because you know, obviously I didn't do it intentionally, but it's just, you're getting all of these influences. So that's what keeps me up at nights is worrying that I might unintentionally co-opt somebody's idea that, you know, that I don't, that I obviously don't want to do that. So, um, um, yeah, so so we're, we're still kind of sorting that. We're both kind of working on our stories and seeing if we can find better endings for both and whatever, but um, but, but the actual plagiarism, you know, it, it's, no, I see, I see it. Yeah, no, and I'll just say from a publisher's perspective, like, 
I get a lot of like, what about copyright? And like, it's the last thing you need to worry about. And anytime I see like a person who asks, well, how do I, you know, protect it? Or do I need an NDA? Or, or, or they put in their thing that they've copyrighted it. Like that is the biggest newbie move. Like nobody cares. Don't tell anybody that you've done that. It's it's like Deborah said, you know, there's no original ideas, it's all in the execution, and nobody can steal your voice, your style, your 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 words. Thank you very much. And I got just a few more questions for you. A self-published author starting to produce their own audiobooks. What does that look like in terms of accurate royalties, production costs, etc.? Um, our start is with stories you know if if you are interested in storytelling and art that creates characters and scenes and creates sort of a world then that, that might be the, the thing that you want to do is children's book illustrations um, uh, then I would just start developing work that you love to do and that you want to keep doing because once you start doing something Usually, you're going to be doing it for a while. Um, so I think those are the two things I would I would think about before you go into the children's book illustration. I had uh, three other questions, but at this point, we've exhausted our time. That has been a lot of this. So are there several questions that students wanted to ask? Can I see a raise of hands of how many wanted to? Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I'm scratching my questions, and the floor is now open. Hi, my name is Nicole Street, and I have a question for Laura. Um, you mentioned something about putting a book up for auction or some auction process. I've never heard of that, and I'm quite curious. Oh. So um, an agent will present um, a book project to editors at various houses. And if it's a really hot project, um, then they will hold an auction where the publishers will bid on that project. And it's a mix of what the advance is, you know, all the different financial terms, and then sometimes it's a, it's a marketing plan that demonstrates what the publisher is going to do for the book, and then the agent will um, award a winner of the auction and place it with the right house. And there are times, and, and this is this is our, our best um, uh, at Chronicles, so there have been times we've been awarded books where we've been not been the highest bidder, but we've presented the best plan, or it just sort of feels like the right house for the book or feels like the right editor. Um, so that happens um, several times a year and sometimes it's a real scramble. Sometimes it's we get the project on Monday and they want the proposals on Friday and we throw together a marketing plan and, um, and sometimes it ha has to happen really quickly. Publishing, like you haven't had anything published before. 
for um, would having some sort of resume attached with your cover letter help uh, influence a publisher that hey this person actually has some idea of what they're doing or is it just as long as you execute it you can have like no no um, training at all as long as you execute it you're pretty much good to go which one would you prefer um, I mean a resume wouldn't hurt if it demonstrates some something that will help um, the editor understand who you are and what you can do for the book you know if you've been um, a bookseller for 10 years or something I mean I don't know that a resume necessarily needs to accompany it but it's something you can mention in the cover letter or if you have um, been a preschool teacher and have done, you know, and know how to do read alouds or something, anything that may be relevant to the book, um, I would make reference of necessarily in a cover letter, not necessarily in a, in a resume format, but um, they're, they're definitely, you know, and, you know, or if you, you know, are like the world champion unicycle juggler, I don't know, something that makes you interesting, um, those, are, those are things that um, are worth calling out. I mean, you definitely, the, the work ultimately will get will be what um, what what gets an editor's interest, but anything you can do to sort of uh, present yourself as a as a person and things in your background that contribute might contribute to the success of the book um, are worth mentioning. The one hundred dollar bills don't tell you for anything. They do not. Okay, the funniest <laughs> <laughs> proposal deliver. I mean, we we do get a lot of you know, tchotchkes with our proposals, but one time one of our publicity assistants, uh, there's a package for you downstairs. She goes down to get it. A guy in a Spider-Man costume with flowers and candy delivering a book proposal. It was so weird, hilarious, I put it on Instagram, but we did not acquire that book. Thank you very much. Okay, hi, my name is Christian, Christian Corleo, and I have two questions for both. Oral. One, like what, like how do you determine whether whether or not your illustrations are good enough for a for you to be used in a children's book? And two, what kind of medium do you usually usually think would be best for you best for making illustrations for a for a picture book? Could it be it like digital or just like pastels or just pencil and paper or with colored pencils or whatever? Well, I'll answer your second question first. Um, I think any, all the mediums are wide open. There's books that are being done digitally or a combination of fine art media and digital. Um, it really, there's no limit. There's 3D work that's being done, about little sculpty uh, sculptures being used for illustration. Um, collage, I mean, it's really wide open. So in that sense, you know, you have a lot of freedom there, and that's where you kind of want to decide what you love to use, you know, what, what you're best at and what you really like to use. That's how I would determine that. And then the, your first question is trickier, though, because you're asking how do you know if your illustrations are good enough to be published? Well, you don't <laughs> until they're published, I suppose. But, uh, but even if they're not, you know, you have to have a certain amount of belief in what you do or confidence in what you do. And if you love what you do, you usually are going to think it's, you know, it's good. Um, but you don't really know until you get it out there. But even if, you know, there's going to be a lot of rejections, that's how it goes. And you just have to keep, you know, keep putting your work out there and see what happens. Hello. My name is Aquila Lewis, and I have a question for uh, Laurel as well as for Laura. Um, we'll start with Laurel. Um, how often does the illustrator seek out the author? I'm interested in working with the illustrator where I can just see the picture and then write the story. That's one thing. But the other question for Laura is, um, I'm also a spoken word artist and I really enjoy rhyming and those type of things. Um, how often, or how are those type of books selling in your in Chronicle? And um, are they great uh, stories that come out of that? Um, let's see, um, your, your question was about seeking out authors and if I do that. Um, I haven't, 
usually the, um, it's like what Deborah said, usually the publisher will buy a manuscript and then they'll look for an illustrator who they think would be good at illustrating it. Um, often I don't have any contact with the author at all. And in some ways I sort of prefer that because then I can do what I want to do and they can do what they want to do and we're not influencing each other or trying to change each other. Um, I, I do mostly fairy tales and legends and things like that. So I seek out stories that are, you know, have some kind of magic or mystery to them that have already been written. Tell me more about your question in terms of spoken word and performance and what that means for books. Um, I, I have a lot of poems that I feel like that become um, picture books or reader, reader books or something. I forgot what you said, the, the names, the different names. Um, and I just wanted to know, like, what are the sales? Like, how is that type of format selling in the publishing companies? Because that's something, that's who I am. So I want to be able to put myself out there. In terms of picture books, rhyme with caution. It's, <laughs> yeah, I bet you did. Um, when it's done well, it's delightful. When it's done poorly, it's excruciating. Um, and the, the good news, though, for, for the kind of books I think you're, for um, middle grade and YA is, you know, Kwame Alexander just won the Newbery Prize and Jackie Woodson's oh, bought a new trophy cabinet in the last year or so. Um, novels in verse, I think, are only gonna grow as a result of those successes. Um, and uh, do you guys know what I'm talking about, Kwame Alexander and Jackie Woodson? Uh, Kwame Alexander um, is a, I'm gonna call it middle grade, um, uh, his book, The Crossover, just won the Newbery Award. It's a novel in verse um, about twin teenage boys and their father who is a former basketball star. And it's gorgeous and it's heartbreaking and it's beautiful and he deserved everything he's got. Um, Jackie Wood, I call it Jackie, but we're friends. Jacqueline Woodson's book, Brown Girl Dreaming, won the National Book Award as well as a Newbery Honor and a Coretta Scott King Honor and, you know, who knows all what else. Um, and it's also an absolutely gorgeous book. Um, I, I ran into her um, at the, in the bathroom at BEA and told her how much I loved her book. <laughs> and, um, and so those kinds of books, um, it's really exciting to see those kinds of novel, what, poetry books, novels in verse, biography, whatever you want to call them, um, getting that kind of attention. Um, not only because there's um, those two particular books and others like them are so great to read, but Again, my, as the mother of a teenage son, they are such an excellent way in for kids who are intimidated by big blocks of words on a page. And there's, you know, teenage boys all over the country, all over the world, reading the crossover who would never pick up a poetry book. Right. Um, so that's that's exciting. And um, Chronicle has done two um, novels in verse. Um, one last year called. Um, rhyme Schemer and uh, the follow-up this year called House Arrest um, that uh, everybody should read. They're so <laughs> they're so good, and they are also uh, from the perspective of um, uh, twelve and thirteen year old boys, and um, um, are, are contemporary and heartbreaking and hilarious and. Um, and I'm, I'm really excited that we're that we're publishing them. So the good news is there there is that going on. And again, I think with the successes of the crossover and Brown Girl Dreaming, we're only going to see more of it. Yeah, I have a question, and um, and it's about creative innocence. Okay, and it's for you're an artist, you're you're a writer, you're an artist, and. I think, you know, I would say to all the students, go take a children's literature book class at your university. However, in, with creative innocence, how do, you, how do you keep your innocence in, in creating something fresh and new and still get this balance of knowledge? So, so that's, that's my question. What would you recommend to the students? How can they remain innocent in their work and still? Still know everything. <laughs> that I mean, that's a really good. That's a really good question. And you know, I'm, honestly, I don't. I don't think I ever did take any sort of children's literature, like whatever course. And in fact, I thought about going back to master's programs. And you know, I think I just don't want to be that analytical about stuff. But as all my students 
have heard several times now. You know, when I was starting out, I read hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of picture books because I didn't know the format and I didn't know how they worked and I needed to kind of discover what the edges of that whole area were. I needed to know what, what did not fit into the picture book thing and what, like how you could stretch this in this way and just kind of get an idea of the parameters. And then after that, like I don't read so many anymore. I've talked with my students a lot about just keeping yourself emotionally healthy as an artist. And I, I was telling them sometimes I walk into a bookstore today and I see all these picture books and I start freaking out. I'm like, I'm never going to sell another picture book. They're too many. So you really need to know yourself and what's going to help you. But it's essential when you're starting out to really understand what what a picture book is and what has, has been done and what hasn't been done. And, um, and so I kind of think of it as just kind of loading your head up with that information and then cutting things off and moving forward. I, you know, I do try to read. I read my friend's picture books, and I go into a bookstore, and I kind of look around at stuff and sort of see if something's been talked about a lot. But I, you know, I don't want tons and tons of other influences. So it's, it's, it's a challenging line. So I, I want to speak to that. Um, just as a, a creative person and speaking to all you creative people, you know, to be able to yeah, learn kind of the parameters of what you have to do and then really trust yourself in your creative process that what you put out is original and there's no one else who does what you do. And that, you know, what you're gonna produce is unique. And even if you do have all these influences from all these different areas and artists, and um, it's still whatever you, ha whatever you come up with is gonna be completely you. And to trust in that and to keep moving forward and just getting whatever is in your head out of your head and then you know you can always go back and like trim it up or fix it up but get it out get whatever is true in you out I think that's such an interesting question because it's such a quandary and it has a lot to do with education you know once you go down the road of being educated and being skillful at what you do there's no going back so, you, you know, Picasso had that famous quote, I spent my whole life trying to um, paint and draw like a child again, and I think I succeeded. Um, and, this, and he was so accomplished. So, you know, it's, it's a really tricky question because there is a certain amount of charm and honesty and that comes through with, without the education. You think about folk artists like Grandma Moses or, um, you know, some of the famous Nunnies painters and things like that. So I think it's a it's a really good question, but I think I think uh, Allegra made a good point that at some point you just have to rely on just what you do is is unique for what it is, whatever it is, because uh, whatever you do is going to be special without you trying to be. You know, you can't help being who you are. <laughs> so you just go down that path. And Hi, good morning. My name is James Fairbanks. Um, I had a question uh, for all the panelists. Um, as artists, like when you release a successful book, like like we're talking about, like a really successful book, uh, besides the royalties, what would you consider to be the most rewarding aspect as an artist having completed, whether it's a book or a pic or an audio book? What would you consider to be the most rewarding aspect, you know, as artist, publisher, audio book? Um, come just what pops up right away is um, talking to people and say, you know, oh, I love that book. This has helped me so much and or, you know, has influenced my life so much. Um, and that is the most rewarding thing, at least for me. You know. Yeah, absolutely. And with, you know, with kids, you're not necessarily going to be talking to a kid who lives across the country. But if, you know, some parent says, Oh my gosh, you know, I read this book. They did, did that with Interstellar Cinderella. We, we just read this every night for the last, I finally asked for a break. But I, there is nothing better than that. There's no award, there's no amount of money, there's no nothing that is better than knowing that some child somewhere's life is being made better by work. And that's something that, you know, we get so caught up in the process and so caught up in all this technical stuff that we have to learn. It's almost a shock sometimes. I'll get an email, I'm like, oh my gosh, there's a kid reading my books. 
somewhere. That's so cool. You, you almost forget about it because it's so it's so removed. But that's like, what? what? Yeah. <laughs> but but that's the thing. I mean, it's so helpful to every once in a while just go. I'm doing this. That was it. Was um, it really um, became clear to me once when just some one friend of mine said, you know. I have uh, my little daughter's been sleeping with a quiet book under her pillow every night, and I just thought, you know, and, and most of you know about the that moment of quiet that inspired that book. I was like, if I had not, if I had not had that ten minutes of quiet before the concert, this little girl many years later would not have her favorite book. So that's a real good touchstone to just keep going back to. Like this is the reason that you should be doing this, or you should want to do this, and the rewarding thing. And if that child is not the reason that you want to do this, you might want to think about something else. For me, there's like two two main rewards. One is the work itself. Like, you know, what is the most engaging thing and the thing you want to do the most when you, you know, wake up, you know, and spend the day doing. And then the second thing that we, you know, that we're talking about, I had a, a teenage girl email me and say, um, it was so touching. She said, "You are my childhood. I spent I spent all my time in my room with poring over your books." And I was like. I never realized, you know, like how touch, you know, how what an impact that could have. I hadn't even really thought too much about it. So, and that was really special. <laughs> and um, it, it, I agree absolutely. You know, at the end of the day, it's about the kids and putting books in kids' hands that matter to them. Um, hashtag why we do what we do, which I publish a lot. Um, but as a publisher, making authors and illustrators' dreams come true is almost as exciting. And seeing some of the people we've worked with who published their first book and their second book or who've had been invited to go lecture in Japan be, like randomly because we published their book and just have these amazing experiences, that's really exciting for me too, to see the way that the book can really transform the lives of authors and illustrators in ways that they hadn't expected. I think there's also a normalcy not used to it. Um, I'm Allegra Colston, <laughs> and um, I wanted to ask a question kind of following up on the copyright idea. Um, I recently went to a talk talking about um, if you're an artist for an animation company, how copywriting your stuff is really helpful because a lot of the contracts are like, we own your style forever, and you're just like, what? <laughs> But is that ever a problem in publishing children's books, or is it kind of the opposite, where it doesn't really happen? Because you're saying don't worry about copyright, but like I don't want somebody to own my style forever. So yeah, I guess it's more for Laura than anyone else. I mean, I won't claim to be an, an expert, but but basically, and maybe um, uh, Lauren can talk about this more from an illustrator and, and what rights you do give up and what rights you retain. But depending on the contract, the work you do for a children's book is pretty much owned by the publisher. Um, that can vary a lot depending on the illustrator and the contract and the agent, but for the most part, we own that work and we um, own the sub-rights to it. So if you publish you know, the, the Happy Tree with Chronicle, we will sub-write you know, the Happy Tree audiobook and the Happy Tree pajamas and you will get a cut of that, um, but ultimately the rights to that um, work, you know, will be copyright, Allegra, your last name, but we will own the right to sell that work as it relates to, to the book. Laura, a redemption question about two things. What if, uh, but you don't own the rights to the style. If an artist has a specific style and they use that style for another book somewhere else, there's no stylistic ownership. It's just everything that's related to that book. Yeah, no, and lots of publisher, uh, lots of illustrators publish with lots of different publishers, and they know when they're buying and book, they're buying an Allegra book and it's going to have a, a certain look. Were there any other questions? Uh, we'll take one more and I think we'll conclude because we're a few minutes over. We can stay for time. Oh, no, we're going till 12. So we're gonna keep <coughs> Hi, my name is Kirsten. I had a question for Laurel. Um, I was just curious, how did you sell your first illustrations? 
Well, I kind of did it the old-fashioned way. Um, I made up three, di three portfolios that were identical, and I went to New York, and I dropped, there's a, something called a drop-off policy, maybe Laura, I don't know if Chronicle has that now. But um, the publishers would have a designated day of the week where you could drop off your portfolio, and then they would look at it, and you'd pick it up that day or the next day. And, you know, a lot of publishers have a lot of different imprints under one publisher. It's like an umbrella. And so one publisher, like Penguin, has Dial, uh, uh, Warren, uh, Viking, I mean, a number of different imprints. So you can go to one building and actually leave your portfolio off at different uh, publishers located in the same building. They have their own staff, you know, an editorial boards and art directors. Um, so that's... When you, when you drop off, you'll get, you know, sometimes you'll get nothing. Sometimes they'll say they want to talk to you. Sometimes they'll leave you a letter saying, stay in touch. We don't have a manuscript right now. Um, and so I got lucky. And so I dropped my uh, portfolio off at Dial Books. And they had just bought a manuscript from a, a new author. And they were looking for an illustrator. And my work kind of fit it. So it was really, you know, it's a lot of luck, really. But I did that for a couple of weeks. Um, but now um, you can approach uh, publishers in lots of ways. You can do mailings, email, um, direct them to your website. Um, there's a whole thing about self-promotion. Get your stuff into illustration annuals because art directors look at those, like Communication Arts or 3x3 Magazine. Um, I'll be talking a lot about that during the illustration segment. But there's ways to get your work, you know, in front of publishers. If not, um, we still have extra time. I'm going to go into the other three questions that you can have. If there are other questions that pop up, please, you know, it's, it's your time to open the guys ask questions. Uh, so, Laura, this is a question for you. This is a two-part question. Uh, do you prefer receiving manuscripts from an agent or directly from a writer? And as a rule, do publishing houses prefer manuscripts with or without a um, we um, uh, accept manuscripts both ways. Not every house does. I would say most of our editors do prefer to work with agents for a lot of the reasons that Deborah um, outlined, but we definitely do work directly with a portion of our, um, of our authors um, on, our, on our list. Um, and what was the second question? The second question was that the publishing houses prefer manuscripts with or without illustrations. Um, if the author, if, for the most part, unless it's an author illustrator, somebody who's created a full picture book that they're presenting, which definitely happens, um, then no, no illustrations with it, just a manuscript if you're, if you're a writer. Do they retain their full, full creative control? I. Mm, no. <laughs> okay. um, I, I would say because, it, and it depends on uh, who they're working with as a producer, there's there's certain guidelines that you do have to follow as far as um, the uploading requirements and the files, you know, the, the types of files that you make um, that you have to follow in the mastering. Um, but as far as creative wise, that kind of goes along with the producer or that you work with. Um, and that's that's the person that kind of steers you towards like what will actually work sound wise uh, with certain text in the regards of uh, children's books. If you do have like underlying sound or underlying music, you don't want it to distract from the text, and you want to make it a, a holistic experience. So, you know, that's where like the author can give recommendations for it, but you're really, when you hire a producer to um, to work with you, you're really relying on that person's uh, artistic capabilities as well to make sure that they're putting together a package that is is going to work, like logistically and creatively. And I think also, like with any creative field, I think it's important that, uh, that everyone be open to suggestions. So someone like yourself who's experienced as a producer, you might have certain It's good if the author is 
already knows what they want. You know, if they already know that this this voice needs to sound like this, this character needs to you know be, have a specific type of voice. Then, I mean, the more specific that the author already is, is will make it easier in the process, in the production process. Okay. Yeah. And the uh, last question I had here actually is part of the direct review, but I think that Deborah Moore had some input on this, and perhaps uh, our other two guests too. How are companies such as Amazon impacting the children's book market? Uh, what are the pros and cons of these online marketing giants? Oh, okay. Um, you know, I have actually, I have written here because this is the one thing that I woke up and kind of in the middle of the night. It's like, I didn't tell them this. Support your independent bookstores. Support your independent bookstores because Amazon, as you've seen both in the audio and everything, they're taking a larger, larger chunk of the market. They're starting to, um, to extend their creative control to the like finished product. It's just, I, and, and again, I have definitely benefited from Amazon picking some of my books as one, like one of the best books of the month. That was a huge, wonderful thing. But we need to keep the independent bookstores in business. And, and let me just tell you, these independent booksellers, you go in and introduce yourself, they will say, oh my gosh, I loved your book so much. They will say, I hand sold this book to, to 10 people last week. There is no way, you know, Amazon will post a little thing about it, but there's nothing like a bookseller taking somebody by the hand. There was this woman at Vroman's bookstore in Pasadena who when I met her, she just said, oh my gosh, when the Easter Cat Cal Galley came in, I like, I read it to every single person in the store. I went around to every single person in the store. They're, they're, it's completely invaluable. That is so important. So nurture those relationships. And, and if, you know, if you have a website, and, and a bookseller goes there and sees a link to Amazon, you know, that's not great. Make sure you link to an independent bookstore, I would say exclusively, or at least in addition to, because independent bookstores, you hear the independent bookstores going, you know, this author came in and then they talked about Amazon or they talked about buying, you know, they're not gonna wanna deal with you again. So just for the health of your mind and for the health of the industry, support your independent bookstores and encourage your friends to buy from them. That's the end of my diatribe. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> um, oh man, how much time you got? It's <laughs> um, it's everything Deborah said, and you know, but from a publisher perspective, we can't deny that Amazon is one of, if not the biggest customer of our books, and we need to work with them very closely on sales and marketing and relationships, and having a books presence and having an author's presence at Amazon, putting the best foot forward is um, uh, essential to what we do as a publisher. So we are cons constantly balancing um, uh, what we do for Amazon, what we do for our independents, what we do for our school and library markets. We have a lot of markets that we service and Amazon is one and it's a big one, but it's not, um, we can't put all of our eggs in one basket. And, um, and it's a constant um, challenge. And Amazon doesn't make bestsellers. That is, Amazon will sell a book that's a bestseller, but bestsellers are made by independent booksellers, by librarians, by reviewers, by kids on the playground. Um, Amazon does not, it, it is not powerful in that way, um, which is very, is important to keep in mind. Um, Amazon also, and we'll talk about this this afternoon too, has so many weird categories that everyone's Uncle Joe is a best-selling author. And so I would be very wary of that when you hear that. Um, and and that's, that's one, one, like a tiny little thing about Amazon that just drives me crazy. So um, it's, it's, cha it's done a lot, it's changed a lot. It's, um, there's, a, there's a lot of, there's, definitely some pros to Amazon, but it's um, but it's challenging. And I just heard that they're trying to like pay self-published authors by the page. So so if so if you so if somebody buys your book and they only read 20 pages of it, you're only gonna get paid on the 20 pages they read. Like yeah, I don't know if that's actually gonna fly, but I heard that was something that they're floating. So and to my knowledge Amazon has not turned a profit in the 20 years or whatever it's been in business. So they are constantly reinventing themselves as well. Um, so it's um, it, it's a lot. I could talk about all the different aspects of it all day. But um, but to Deborah's point, especially as somebody who is trying to get a foothold in this industry, Amazon is not going to do you anything other than make your book available. They're not going to support your career. They're not going to hand sell your book. They're not going to do the things that you need to do to um, to build yourself in this business. Thank you very much. Well, on that note, I think we've concluded our panel discussion. I want to thank our guests. Thank you.